Hello everyone and thank you for attending today's webinar, Finding Grains and Anti-Grains. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are several application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We'll try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. We do capture all questions. A copy of today's slide deck and some links to additional materials are available in the resource list widget that looks like a green folder. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the Maximize icon on the top right or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical dif difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day um, after this live session and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Now I'd like to introduce Matt Nowell, um, the EBSD product manager for EDAX. Matt has a passion for EBSD and microstructural characterization. He joined TechSEM Labs um, when he graduated from the University of Utah in 1995 with a degree in material science and engineering. At TSL, he was part of the team that pioneered the development and commercialization of EBSD and OIM. After EDAX acquired TSL in 1999, he joined the applications group to help continue to develop EBSD as a technique and integrate structural information with chemical information collected using EDS. Within EDAX, Matt has been involved in a number of roles including product management, business development, customer and technical support, engineering, and application support. He greatly enjoys the opportunity to interact with scientists, engineers, and microscopists to help expand the role that EBSD plays in materials characterization. In his spare time, Matt enjoys playing golf and pondering if changing the texture of his clubs will affect his final score. Now, Matt, over to you. Thanks, Sue. And for anyone answer, wondering, it's no, it doesn't help the score. So my webinar today is entitled Finding Grains and Anti-Grains. And so to give a little bit of a preview of what we're going to cover today, uh, I'm going to introduce the concept of grains uh, and grain boundaries and then how we measure that grain size, uh, talk a little bit about special boundaries, uh, how we can measure grain shape, and then I want to introduce a, a new concept and feature into our software, which is the idea of what we call anti-grains, which I'll try to uh, explain and uh, show how it can be used in, in a couple of examples. Um, before I get going, I'd like to acknowledge, of course, the work of, of a number of uh, colleagues and friends, Stuart Wright and Renee DeClo from EDAX and Ron Witt from EBSD Analytical, who have helped uh, help put this data together and, and assisted in a lot of valuable discussions trying to make sense of some of this. So the first thing to start off with is the idea of what is a grain. Um, a grain is a region of material that has the same crystallographic orientation. Uh, the nucleation of this, these grains can be either random or non-random, and I'll explain that in, in a slide. Uh, and of course, EBSD is a useful tool for investigating and, and understanding this. And so this is a little schematic from uh, uh, Bill Callister's Introduction to Material Science book, where it kind of shows the solidification of grains. And so each little block would be a little uh, crystallographic unit cell. Uh, they nucleate at points and they grow. And in this case, it's sort of a random distribution. And as they grow together, um, those interfaces are grain boundaries. And then, of course, the grains are the area of the same, uh, the same orientation. And so this is an example of a random nucleation. Uh, with EBSD, one of the applications, of course, is trying to say, can we understand how grains nucleate and form? And so this is an example uh, from the growth of an indium oxide film, uh, looking at a cross-section. Uh, and in that bottom uh, colorful orientation map, we see the substrate uh, at the bottom in red. And we see uh, at the beginning of the uh, indium oxide layer some blue grains showing the, that the grains nucleate uh, with a specific orientation, but as they grow uh, further up vertically, they change color. 
And so that, that's one, uh, one mode of, of grain growth. But it, it goes to show that grains can nucleate with the same orientation, and, and sometimes that, that orientation will grow, and other times it will, it will, uh, different growth will occur. So uh, taking a step beyond grains, we can go to the idea of microstructure. Um, when we talk about microstructure, we're talking about what's the size of these grains, what's the shape of the grains, and what's the phase and chemical distribution within the area. Uh, from an EBSD perspective, we've often said what's missing. Um, and with that, we talk about crystal orientations and then the grain boundary misorientations. So today I'm going to focus on grain size, grain shape, and the grain boundary misorientations. Um, part of the motivation uh, for this talk uh, was the idea of some of the different ways grain size is measured and why uh, EBSD uh, complements and sometimes improves on those techniques. And traditionally, they've been uh, measured with either optical or electron microscopy. Uh, and, and grain boundary misorientations, of course, cannot be uh, obtained uh, from those methods. So how do we traditionally see grains? Uh, again, this is a, a little schematic from, from my Introduction to Material Science book, and it kind of shows two different examples. Uh, and so the one on the left, we see that uh, as the, as the uh, imaging beam, the light or electron beam comes down, it reacts differently to different grains. Uh, that scattering differences causes difference in contrast, and we can see grain contrast. Uh, we see that on, on that image. Uh, in other times, the sample is etched, and we get some topographical differences at the grain boundaries. Uh, when the imaging source hits that, it scatters it uh, differently. And so we see grain boundary contrast. So in that image on the bottom right, we see the outlines of the grains have been traced out. Um, to do that approach, generally chemical etching is used to reveal the grain boundaries. And the, the worry here is that it doesn't always reveal all the grain boundaries, and it can have issues with uh, some multi-phase materials of getting the, the contrast we need to, to image these. And then once we have the contrast, there are different approaches we can use to uh, assign a measurement to this. And so these are just a couple of different uh, examples. Um, you can see on the, on the center image there, uh, there are some intercept lines and some intercept circles uh, that allow you to count the number of intercepts per unit line length. Uh, there's also a grain size chart there on the right where you can uh, go to a specific magnification and compare your microstructure and say, which one does it look like uh, the most? But again, for either of these approaches, you really need positive identification of the boundary locations, uh, especially for any automated uh, analysis tool to work correctly. So from our perspective, you know, the, the motivation for using EBSD for grain size measurements is that this uncertainty in boundary position uh, was an area we thought EBSD would work well, particularly in materials where it's hard to get good grain boundary contrast or also in areas where the scale of the microstructure starts to go lower than you can traditionally do with, say, optical microscopy. So this is an example from a paper uh, by Austin Day uh, looking at a, a traditional image on the left and then showing where the boundaries occur on the right. And we see that some boundaries are, are missed with the, um, with the etching approach. Okay, now for the important question, if we're measuring grain size, what's the importance of this, and why would we want to measure grain size? And so this was a, a quote I saw in a Materials Today article a few years ago, uh, and it was it really captured in my mind. It's a, it is now well known that the grain size is the major microstructural parameter in dictating the properties of a polycrystalline material. So these are just two equations we see that we can we can look at properties of material and correlate that to the uh, the measured grain size. And of course, the grain size can really be translated to a grain boundary density uh, within a, a measurement area. But this shows how the yield stress or the steady state strain rate can be correlated to the grain size of a material. And so if you're trying to engineer or, or improve on those properties, it gives you an idea of how you want to control the grain size. You, know, you Sometimes you want smaller grain sizes for some properties. Other times you want larger grain sizes, and usually in material science you're trying to balance all these things pulling you in different directions. So uh, with EBSD and with orientation imaging microscopy, or OIM, 
what we're doing is we're doing a, a series of automated eBSD measurements. And so you can see in this little schematic here in the top right, we select an area of interest. Uh, so we give it a, a, a length and a width that we're going to image, and then we specify a step size or the, the spacing between measurements. And for each of those points, it's important to realize what we get out of it is a, is a discrete orientation measurement. Uh, and it's that orientation measurement we're going to use to, uh, to define the grains of the material. Um, I, my, my colleague, Renee DeClo, had a, had a great quote I've heard repeated a few times is that, you know, we measure this array of orientations. The software doesn't know what a grain is. We have to provide an algorithm so it can determine what a grain is. Uh, like in, in light microscopy, it's looking for that contrast change. We need to give it some rule to say this amount of change qualifies as a grain boundary. And so what we do is we specify a misorientation tolerance or a grain tolerance angle uh, to determine if we think something's a grain. And it's done point to point uh, along the measurement array. So to show a little example, these are my measurements on this uh, measurement grid. I start at a point and then I compare it to its neighbor and say, is, it, is the misorientation difference uh, greater than my grain tolerance threshold or below that? And if it's below that, we're going to group it together in the same grain. And we sort of just repeat the process going through the structure until we find something that changes. And then we say, all right, there's our grain boundary. And we walk through this process. And it just goes along the outer perimeter of the, of the grain, defining where things will be the same or be different. And then here would be one grain here, then it goes to the next point and repeats the process, finding grains as it, grow, as it goes. No. Go to the end there. So in the end, it's just comparing point-to-point -point misorientations. Now, whatever our tolerance is, it's important to note that you know, if I have a tolerance of five degrees, which is generally the default, if the misorientation is 4.9 degrees, it's going to group these two points together. And if it's another 4.9 degrees between it, you'll have a lot of misorientation as you go across the grain. You can see a lot of lattice bending within a grain. It'll still be grouped together. And I'll show some examples of how, for deformed materials, adjusting that grain tolerance angle can be useful in sort of understanding the deformation structure. And then when we present the data, there's a couple of different ways we can present the data. Of course, it's eBSD. It can make lots of different maps. Um, most people are most familiar with the orientation map shown on the left. This is from an aluminum thin film with a strong 111 texture. That's why most of it's blue. Um, when I'm going to talk about grains, the map I'm going to show more, off, more often is the grain map on the right. And so in this case, once we've grouped together the points as grains, they're now randomly colored to show the size and shape and morphology. And so no two adjacent grains are colored the same, uh, but the colors don't correspond to anything in particular. It's just to show uh, what they look like. So you can see that microstructure presented two different ways where we're interested in grains uh, in this presentation. Now, there's a couple of other things besides the grain tolerance angle we specify uh, when we define the software. Um, the first is the number of pixels, the minimum number of pixels needed to define a grain. And the idea here is that the more pixels of the same orientation that are grouped together, we generally feel like it, it improves the confidence in the grain uh, determination. And we'll see some effects of that a little later on. Um, this helps understand sometimes some low-end uh, noise peaks in some of the distribution, sometimes finding just a few pixels together. So you usually wouldn't want to use a single pixel to define a grain. You usually want to use uh, at least more than one. Uh, you also have the option of saying there has to be pixels together on multiple rows if you want to put a little bit more stringent requirement on how you're defining a grain. And then I mentioned earlier, the other thing we do is we have to set this grain tolerance angle. Um, for some materials, this can be rather easy, some nice recrystallized materials. And I put here for others, rather than saying it's difficult, it's at least interesting. Um, and in the, in the next slide, I'll show you an example. Really, the importance here, the selection that you want to use kind of depends on what you want to use your grain size measurements for. If there's a specific property you're trying to use that grain size to correlate it to, uh, may help drive that selection. Um, the nice thing about eBSD is it's easy to create multiple uh, 
uh, different sets of grains and compare them uh, to see which one would be the most appropriate. So this is just an example. Uh, this is one of my, my favorite examples because on the top left you can see our eBSD image quality map where we see lots of uh, boundary contrast. In the bottom we see the orientation map. And then if we look in that middle three images, if we define the grains with a 10 degree tolerance angle, you see most of the data is defined into three separate blocks. If we change that tolerance down to one degree, we get kind of that top block still about the same. The medium block is broken up into a few smaller grains, and that bottom area has broken up into uh, a few more numerous grains. And then if we go down to about a half a degree tolerance, that structure starts to be uh, broken down into even smaller sub-blocks. But you can see that they're clearly coherent in what they're defining as, as structure. And so oftentimes what I tell people to do is go ahead and set a number of these different grain tolerance angles and look at the grain maps and see the structure. Uh, if you go down low enough, it's going to start to look very noisy, and then as it goes larger, you'll see more coherency and, and order into the grains. Now, of course, one thing to be aware of with your EBSD data, your, your cleanup can alter uh, your results, and in particular your grain size measurements, um, in ways that you should at least understand what different grain cleanup routines are doing. Uh, this is just an example. These are two different microstructures where there should be areas without grains. The top's a thermoelectric film uh, that's been crystallized with some amorphous regions. Uh, the bottom's are microelectronic lines in, a, in an amorphous oxide. And if I clean those up very aggressively, it artificially creates microstructure. So when you do EBSD data cleanup, uh, I recommend doing it so you can see before and after and compare the results to be aware of what your cleanup is doing to the microstructure. And of course, recording that and reporting that so people are aware. Um, obviously, if you're growing out grains, your grain size will get larger. Uh, and you want to make sure you're doing that in an appropriate manner. So I wanted to talk for just a, a few slides about grain boundaries. Uh, EBSD is really the ideal tool for measuring grain boundaries because we can do it quickly, easily, and we can measure a lot of them uh, in, a, in a short period of time. And this is a, a slide from uh, Porter and Easterling's uh, phase book. Um, and this is a, a, a chart from there, and it basically says, you know, you can have grain boundaries that are low angle boundaries or high angle boundaries, and we also have what we can call a special uh, type of grain boundaries. And the important thing for all these grain boundaries is that the, the grain boundary type will, will affect the grain boundary energy associated with that type. And so, for visualization purposes, this grain boundary energy will affect uh, the boundary's ability to be etched. And so what we find is sometimes some of these boundaries are not revealed through traditional etching just because they have a, a lower grain boundary energy. And so low angle boundaries, um, these are ones, that, again, that can be sort of visualized as, uh, as two different lattices that can be uh, described by having an array of dislocations causing the small misorientation between them. So in this little schematic, you'll see there's a set of, of dislocations that are causing this, this small angular change between those two lattices. Um, you know, you can think of this as sort of subgrain or, or dislocation cell type, type structure. And that as you put more and more uh, dislocations in there, you get more misorientation, you get more grain boundary energy. And it's almost linear like we saw on the curve on the last slide. Whereas if we go to a high angle boundary, now the mismatch between the two different lattices is so much you can't just put a, a, a dislocation line through there to show the difference. And you end up with sort of this grain boundary transition zone where, where you don't get much, much, much mismatch, uh, or you get a lot of mismatch, not a lot of match between the two lattices. And so it's easy here to visualize to say at that boundary, that disorder uh, can influence your boundary property. So it, it's easy to imagine how you could get some diffusion going on that boundary. You can get some segregation of smaller atoms that, that go to that position because there's more space available. And so your properties will be a little bit different with high angle grain boundaries. So the first example I want to show some grain size measurements for uh, is one of these aluminum thin films. And so I collected from about a 180 micron squared area, 150 nanometer step size to get about a half a million and a half points. Um, 
when when I do my measurements, I use a hexagonal grid. Uh, the reason I like to do this is a hexagonal grid puts more points per area uh, to help define the grain size and grain shape. Uh, in this case, the grain size was just over 4 microns uh, as an equivalent diameter, and just over 1,500 whole grains were measured. Now, the reason I selected this sample uh, was a, were a few reasons. First, if you see that image on the right, uh, that's the SEM image. This is a, a deposited film. Uh, it's difficult to visualize the grain boundaries. Uh, the grain size itself is, is below really what you can do with optical microscopy. And then, as I'll show on the next slide, the grain size for this uh, material correlates uh, with the reliability of the material in a, in a microelectronic application. And so this was, was one of our, our favorite slides and applications uh, for, uh, for a long time because uh, it was shown that the mean time to failure for an aluminum film could be related both to the texture and the grain size of the film. And so you see there, there's a film with a high time to failure that's nearly all blue, nice sharp texture, and then a, fi a film with, with um, uh, a, a weaker texture. Uh, and so EBSD could measure both of these parameters. So it was a very nice application story uh, to present. So what I wanted to show now is uh, the grain maps from the scan. So my 150 nanometer grain map is shown at the top left. And then what I did with this data to present the effects of step size was to coarsen the data uh, to, to provide different step sizes without having to worry about rescanning the same area and dealing with contamination issues. And so here you'll see the data with 150, and then it just doubles, 300, 600, uh, 1.2 micron, 2.4 micron, and finally up to 4.8 micron steps. Um, you can see on those top three maps, we generally see the grain structure. We have enough points per grain that we, we visualize the grain structure on this scale. Uh, as the number of points decreases in the map, we get fewer pixels per grain. So the point on that bottom right one where the wide areas are areas where we don't have two or more points together, uh, and so it's, it's shaded white. We, we haven't identified as many grains, um, but we see uh, a number of small pixel grains that are associated with that. So when I look at grain data, uh, there's a few things I'll, I'll look at. Uh, it's important to note again when we're when we're looking at grain size to understand how the software calculates that. So the first thing we do is we just count the number of points in a grain, and that's what this distribution on the right shows, uh, just the number of points uh, within a grain uh, for the different detected grains. And so once we have the number of points, we can determine the area of the grain by uh, taking the number of points and multiplying it by a factor based on the step size. And so you can see there for a square grid and a hexagonal grid what the associated area per step size is. And once we have the total area, we can also determine an equivalent diameter um, just through the mathematics shown there. And so generally people will talk about, you know, here's my grain size, talking about an equivalent diameter. But it's important to note that there are lots of different ways to represent this data. And I'll show some examples of, of why that might be useful. Now, the other thing that um, is, is you can select and can be a little confusing is how you display the data. So this is looking at the three distributions. So the one on the left is the number of points. Uh, the one in the middle is the area. The one on the right is diameter. Uh, the important thing I'm showing here is the number fraction. So this is just showing straight numerical averaging of the distributions. Uh, we see a pretty nicely shaped distribution. We also see on the low end a little bit of a peak uh, from that, uh, that bottom little uptick. And so when I see something like that, that's when I might start thinking, all right, maybe I'd want to play a little bit with the number of pixels, the minimum number of pixels defining that grain. Uh, I didn't in this case because I want to show the effects through coarsening, but that's kind of a telltale sign of saying uh, that may be an issue. We're getting some some uh, some my brain is frozen. Uh, trying to think of maybe some rogue grains that are being decided. Um, now, the other way of presenting this is through area fraction. And so what this does is, is not just a, a plain numerical averaging, but we're weighting things by the area of the grain. 
And this is actually the default um, distribution presentation used for the for the grain size within OIM analysis. Uh, and it's just important to note that it's showing it a little bit differently. So you can see that peak goes away uh, because those grains are are smaller on the on the low end. So the, the when they're weighted by area, they don't count as much. Um, the important thing from, you know, if you have enough points, these distributions look pretty similar. Uh, if you don't have enough grains, they sometimes will look a little different. Um, the big takeaway I would have from this is if I, if I take the two distributions and put them next to each other, and, and I've applied a highlighting on the one on the right there. So you can see the smallest grains are blue going up through a, through a color scale, so the largest grains are red, and then I apply that same color shading to the map. Visually, when you look at it, your eyes see the larger grains. It's harder to see um, the small grains in the distribution. So when you're looking visually at the average, your eye, I think, tends to see more what the area average would suggest, um, where numerical averaging is going to give you a pure numerical average and count the whole distribution. So it's just good to realize that both are, are available and, and what, they're, um, what they're calculating and presenting uh, for both of them. So now, if I take all these these data sets with their correlated uh, course and step sizes, what I can see is uh, the average number of pixels per grain. Um, so with the 150 nanometer step size, we get quite a few pixels per grain. Uh, and as we course in it, obviously becomes less and less. We see the average grain size diameter for the measurements. Uh, and you can see there that at least for the first three or four, it's pretty close. And then when it gets to be uh, a lot larger step sizes, that average grain size starts to, to go off the charts a little bit. Uh, the, the grain size change relative to the initial grain size. So you can see the first couple there were, you know, one degree or two degrees away or 2% from the initial grain size. Uh, the number of grains that we measure, the total number of grains, um, I think the important number here is this grain size to step size ratio. Uh, as we as we look at the grain diameter, how many steps are we taking across it on average? We're starting at about 30, going to you know 14.72. Um, the rule of thumb I've generally presented to people is you know for a quick map, you'll probably go to take uh, divide your average grain size by five to get one fifth of that. Uh, if you're trying to do a nicer map, uh, dividing it by 10. Uh, and you can approximate the average pixels per grain by taking whatever uh, whatever you're using and squaring it to give you uh, an idea of how many measurements you should get kind of just as a as a rough approximation. The important trade-off here is, of course, the, the fewer points or the larger the step size you uh, you use, the, the more time savings you get. So going from 150 nanometers to 300 nanometers is four times faster over the same area with everything else being equal. So you can see, you know, you, you don't get much improvement in, in grain size measurements between those two step sizes. Um, and of course, for, for things like texture measurements, you don't get much improvement either. The, the flip side to this, of course, is that right now we're talking about grain size, and I mentioned texture. If you're trying to look at, um, you know, fine deformation structure, uh, you may use a finer step size than you would for just grain size measurements. Now, on there, I put a grain size to step size ratio. Um, the important thing to realize there is the effect that this ratio can have on your measurement. So this is just an example on our hexagonal grid kind of showing some circular grains on there. Because what we'd be interested in is as the, as the grain size to step size ratio changes, we get more points near the grain boundaries. Uh, and by that, what happens is when we're near grain boundaries, uh, this is where we can get the possibility of overlapping diffraction patterns. The software has to work to deconvolute the patterns. Uh, and when we do that, at, dislo at grain boundaries, this is where you can get dislocation pile up. Uh, this is where you can get an accumulation of some uh, plastic deformation. And so being able to um, resolve the artifacts of overlapping patterns versus the real microstructure can be a little tricky. And so sometimes you're going to use finer step sizes, like I mentioned, for deformation to help provide a little bit more uh, information in that area. So we can see a little bit of a distribution here of uh, the fraction of points at the boundary 
as a function to this diameter to step size ratio. Uh, and so again, you start getting to that, that 10 ratio, that um, curve is, is starting to flatten out in that area. So of course, it's easy to pick a step size uh, if you know what the grain size is, but if we're if we're trying to measure the grain size, it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. So how can we quickly estimate grain size? Uh, there's really a couple of, of easy ways. Uh, one is the idea of using orientation contrast imaging. So this can be done either through a forward scatter detector or through our Prius detector system, where it gives us fast microstructural contrast. So we see here a colored Prius image on the left. Uh, we see a grain map on the right. And we can see that the, the Prius image, which would be collected in you know a minute or two, gives us a, a decent idea of what the, the grain size and shape is to help pick a step size. The other option would be to use a, a linear intercept method, where we can just set up a series of line scans. Uh, we track the uh, how many steps it is between each change, and from that we can we can figure out a grain size. Um, the nice thing about this approach is you can actually set up independent X and Y step sizes in case you have a, you know, a, a columnar type grain structure uh, that would help speed up the efficiency of, of estimating that grain size. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier with the classification of grain boundaries, um, there's also the idea of these special grain boundaries. And so here uh, on the left, I've shown that initial random high angle boundary with that transition zone. With a special boundary, you can see there's a certain atomic arrangement where there's some uh, matching or order across the lattice. And so um, there are certain misorientation relationships that this occurs. And what happens when we do these is that the grain boundary energy now has a, a, a dip, a decrease in, in relative to a random angle boundary. So here are two examples of this. This the one on the left is showing between an incoherent and coherent twin, and we'll we'll talk about trying to identify these in a, in a few slides. But you can see the grain boundary dips when it's a coherent twin, um, and you can see here this is showing a misorientation of two different uh, types of rotation, and for very specific. Uh, Misorientation, so not only a misorientation angle, but a misorientation axis, the grain boundary dips as well. And so the specific orientation relationships uh, can, be can be detected with EBSD. And so generally, uh, the idea that, that this can be applied for is the idea of grain boundary engineering. Because these boundaries have lower grain boundary energies, they can have preferential properties. And so one of my favorite examples is from uh, Integran. Uh, and, and the idea of grain boundary engineering where they've uh, thermomechanically processed a material to increase the fraction of these special boundaries. And they do this in a battery grid. And, and my favorite anecdote is uh, on the left, the one that had 13% grain boundaries that are special after a certain number of, of test cycles is basically disintegrated. You know, your battery is not useful. The one on the right with a high fraction of boundaries is still intact and operational. So. Generally, we classify special boundaries with a model that's called CSL, or coincident site lattice boundaries. Um, the important thing for these boundaries is we, we define it with a, a sigma and then a number. And that number indicates the, uh, the reciprocal number of lattice points that are coincident. So with this, it's sigma 5. So if we pick a lattice point here uh, and we go five more lattice points, we will go to another coincident site. So whenever these two are overlaid on top of each other, every five steps for the lattice, in the either lattice, the two lattice positions will line up. And so the idea is that those lattices are, are aligned, you're going to have better coherency, better bonding, and better properties. So um, for uh, FCC materials, sigma-3 uh, CSL boundaries are sort of your primary twin boundaries. Uh, your sigma-9s are your twins of twins. And when we look for these, we specify the misorientation relationship. So in a sigma-3, it's 60 degrees, about a 1-1-1 uh, axis. But we also have to specify a tolerance angle. And so um, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. We can use Brandon's criteria, or we can specify just a, a pure number. Uh, the default in our software um, for CSLs is to use the, the Brandon's criteria. Uh, but for twin boundaries, we'll often use five degrees. 
And so the CSL boundaries can be correlated with a number of different properties. Um, this is an example from Abu Ross's group on some uh, thin film solar cells where they've looked at uh, cathode luminescence and EBSD across a solar cell. And they see that the CL contrast uh, doesn't uh, change with um, these special CSL boundaries, whereas they do with random high angle boundaries. And so they, they give different electrical properties, and so you can think about trying to engineer solar cells with, with more of these as well. And for solar cells, this is just to give an idea. Um, this is a, a polycrystalline silicon solar cell. Uh, we can see the grain boundaries in here, and the, the interesting thing about this is the scale. You know, very large grains. This is from a, a combo scan where we've montaged the area. Uh, and so the idea is they want to make these grains as large as possible to be as efficient as possible. But again, these twins uh, that we see here are, are not deterrent to efficiency. And so what we can do is if we look at a grain map with twins or we make grains without twins, we see that we get vastly different microstructures. And so that you can see that's why they, they engineer these grains. We get very large, uh, effective polysilicon grains that are, are good for solar cell performance. And of course, if we're talking about grains, we can go from these very large ones to the smallest ones. Um, I mentioned earlier, we want to have at least multiple points so we have some confidence we've really captured a grain. So, you know, the smallest grains that we've seen with, with traditional EBSD has been down in the 20 nanometer range. Uh, if you talk about transmission EBSD, I've seen numbers lower than 5 nanometers. But, of course, this is very dependent on material, uh, among other things. And it's important to note a lot of times that uh, we're talking about grains. The smallest grains are grains on the small end of a distribution where the average distribution might be larger. Um, a lot of times if people come and say, I've got some 20 nanometer grains, if they mean an average 20 nanometer, it's a lot more difficult than saying I want to pull out 20 nanometer grains in one with an average of 50 or 100 nanometers. And then I mentioned um, in that grain boundary energy slide how the coherency of a boundary can be important. Um, what coherency means is is your, your twinning plane across the material aligned with your grain boundary plane. And of course, in a, in a 2D section of EBSD data, we can't actually see how a grain boundary plane is aligned. It could be vertical or it could be close to horizontal, uh, but we're looking at a, at a 2D section. But what we can do is we can infer coherency by seeing if the trace of a grain boundary uh, is aligned with the twinning plane. So this is just an example uh, from a paper uh, by Stuart Wright um, where the coherent boundaries, uh, the, the trace of the boundary is aligned with coincident planes. You can see that on the circle on the left. Uh, here's a boundary where the grain boundary trace is not aligned with the coincidence uh, plane. We'd say that's an incoherent boundary. But not only can we identify twins via this misorientation relationship, we can also do uh, some degree of coherency analysis. Uh, we do that through using this reconstructed boundary. So we take our, our points on a grid and we fit straight lines between the triple junctions that we detect. So for my example number two, I picked our, our traditional Inconel 600 nickel super alloy looked at about a 360 micron squared area with 300 nanometer steps, again, close for that one and a half million points with a hexagonal grid. In this case, the average grain size was about 15 microns, only 365 grains. I say only, I generally say I, I aim for about a thousand grains when I'm doing an analysis so I get representative grain size and texture. But in this case, it had a lot of twin boundaries. And that's what I was interested in showing. So here are those same grain maps, and we see that same type of behavior, and that those top three rows are, are generally pretty decent to look at. Uh, towards the bottom, we start to see these, these grain maps get a lot more pixelated. And if we look at our, our chart here, what's interesting here is that the, the grain size change uh, starts to go up quite a bit higher than it did earlier relative to the grain size step size ratio. And so, the idea here is why is that? Really, I think it's probably due to the twins in the microstructure, and I'll, I'll try to show why that's the case. So if we take our, our example, and what I've shown here is that the random boundaries are, are colored black. The twin boundaries are colored white. Whenever it's white, we're going to exclude those from our, our grain grouping algorithm. So we go from the grains on the left to the grains on the right. 
with, uh, with a, a little different microstructure. So now if we compile this data here, we can see that grain size change flattens out a little bit. Um, and so uh, the important thing I think here is when you're selecting your step size, uh, you really need to think about your step size relative to your smallest feature of interest. Uh, and how wide your grain size distribution is um, to get an idea if you're going to catch those low end materials. And so, and I think that highlights a concept that not all grains are circular. <laughs> and so, uh, this just shows how we can, this is a small little uh, area propped out of one of those nickel data sets, and uh, we fit an ellipse to each grain so we get an idea of what's the aspect ratio of the, of the major and minor. Uh, axes of these ellipses to get an idea of what's the grain shape uh, and also how it's aligned in the sample. Um, but having an idea of what that, that minimum width is can help select your step size for resolving those fine features. And so I think this also gives the idea that a few different examples that not all grains are circles. So this is from an aluminum 6000 alloy uh, that were processed a few different ways. You can see we get quite different uh, looking grain shapes uh, and microstructures through these different processes. So being able to, to assign shapes and, and uh, sizes to these can be useful. As an example of that, this is uh, a material from a piece of 3D printed uh, aluminum or titanium. Uh, and you can see it kind of has a, a, a lath structure to it. And so the map on the left is a, is a much larger area. The scale bar there is 300 microns. The one on the right is a, is a smaller step size, um, looking at a, at a close-up region. And if we look at our, our grain distribution, uh, this is looking at the grain size and diameter on the left, and then area on the right. And really, I thought, well, grain diameter doesn't make much sense. These are more uh, needly shaped grains, and so you know, grain area would be a more appropriate measure. But if we take our grain area. And then we take our grain shape, we can figure out, say, you know, does it match a circle better? Does it match an ellipse better? And we find a fitting. Uh, we can find an average aspect ratio. We know our aspect ratio, we know our area, we can figure out an average lath width. So in this case, it came out to be about 800 nanometers. And if you want to go beyond averages, you can calculate per grain, you know, what the, what the width distribution would be. Uh, to be able to characterize the material, and in this case, we could correlate it with the, the cooling rate from the 3D printing. And as another cool example, these are some uh, zinc oxide crystals that uh, Joe Michael had. Um, they look like little porcupines, and he used a fib to do a cross-section. And so the, the orientation map is shown there on the left. Uh, the grain map is shown there on the right. Uh, but what we could, uh, what we wondered is how is the the growth in the material? So what we did is again fit ellipses to these and say for the major axis, the major axis of these grains, the long axis, what's the orientation aligned with that axis? And you can see when we make that grain major axis orientation map on the right, we see a lot of them have the same color, indicating they're all kind of growing in these long pillars uh, in the material. Now, one of, the, one of the things EBSD can do well is also identify the phase at the same time. Um, for some traditional materials, it's often difficult to detect both grain size and phase differentiation simultaneously. Uh, and so this is just a nice example. This is a uh, microelectronics component. And if we look at it, you can see there's some big grains on the side smaller grains in the middle, and, and quite a few twins uh, in the material. And so the characterization challenge here is when we, when we looked at it, uh, you can see the Prius contrast on the left shows the grain structure. The Prius contrast on the right, where we're using the top Prius detector, shows atomic number contrast. So we see that the two side regions are one phase. In the center, it's a different phase. And when we tried to differentiate those, they're both cubic structures, face center cubic structures, so very difficult. The lattice parameters are very similar. Uh, it was difficult to differentiate. And of course, when we run into this problem, um, there's a few different ways we can try to solve it, but the, the easiest in this case was to use EDS information. Uh, in this case, we were trying to show it collected pretty fast. 
So this is collected at about 1,400 index points per second. And our, our data can show that in the middle, it's iron and nickel uh, phase. On the edges, it's the copper phase. So we can use that chemical information to guide our phase identification. We call that chi-scan. So the bottom left shows the new phase map where copper's the blue and the iron nickel's the red. Once we have the phases correct, then we have the grain sizes correct for the two different phases, and we can measure the, the grain size per phase uh, easily. So that's kind of traditional grain analysis. Uh, and so what I want to switch to now is, is uh, a newer thing that we're, we're introducing, and it comes back to the area about what about points we cannot index. So these are three different examples. The one on the top left is, is a nickel superalloy, and you can see the points we can't index there are black. And you can see there are really two different kinds of distributions. There are points along grain boundaries or spots within a grain, but there are also a few different places where you get clusters of grains that are not indexed together. And we see that same thing in the middle where we see these dark clusters. And on the right, we see similar clusters in the microstructure. Um, the trick from, from our perspective is that these clusters can be different things. They can be other phases or they can be pores. And so uh, it's easy enough uh, in, the, in, the, in the system to, of course, go back and say, are there patterns from here or not to help say is it a different phase or is it a pore? Um, but we're able to see these clustered non-index points. So what we can do is once we've decided they're pores, uh, we can think of the idea of can we quantify the, the area fraction of the pores in the material. So this is a 3D printed uh, stainless steel sample. Uh, and so traditionally, we'd, we'd try to do this sometimes with something like image quality. So if I take my image quality map and I go to the low end, so I'm doing a color highlighting. Um, but in this case, the, the low end uh, values can be either from the pores, but it can also be along grain boundaries. So one way to try to address that is to say, can we do a grain average image quality map? So what we try to do is bring those grain boundary points that have a low image quality in with the grain interior points and average them out. It can provide a little bit cleaner pore recognition, um, but there's still some grains that produce lower image quality versus others. There's an orientation effect to image quality. But we can do it by indexing success pretty well. So what we can do is we take our, our data set here, we define a threshold. And generally, we'll say competence index greater than 0.1. Here, we're showing the points that are, are not meeting that threshold on the right. And we can take those and say anything that's not indexed is, is a pore. And so here, it's about 3% of the area would be a pore. And so, Basically, what we're doing is if we look back to our initial slide of, of what we were showing here, um, we, we can take points that aren't indexed and start to look at our, our clustering effects. So in this case, uh, anything that's um, not indexed, we can count, say, how many do we need to have together? How, what's the minimum number of points needed? So in this case, we'd say here are three different points that aren't indexed, but they're clustered together. We can combine that, and we can call it an anti-grain. So we don't necessarily have orientation information from that point, but we have the, the spatial size of the local clustering. Uh, and so we can then put these together and say, let's call that a, a particular anti-grain. And they're either not indexed or misindexed, and we've, we've filtered them out through our partitioning. And again, we can set the minimum number of grains or pixels, or net minimum pixel size to avoid single pixel pores or uh, artifacts. And so this allows us to measure this a little more quantitatively. So here we take our data set, we apply our anti-grain uh, definition. We see now the anti-grains, and we can get a distribution of the anti-grain or the pore size in the material. And we can apply a color scale just to kind of see the size distribution. So we can now correlate size of the pores to different regions of the microstructure. And once we've clustered these together, then we can go ahead and start to use some of our geometrical analysis of things like is it a circle, is it an ellipse, what's the aspect ratio, uh, and correlating that with, with other things. <laughs> 
So this just shows an example where we're looking at the aspect ratio of different pores uh, within the material. We can get a statistical distribution of, of what's going on. So it's important to know, of course, um, that when we talk about EBSD, we're looking at a 2D surface. And of course, grains are occurring in a 3D structure. So these are two different 3D volumes, one's from a nickel alloy, another is actually from a, a, a meteorite. And what I did is used the, the software to go in and pick out different grains with different shapes. And you, you know, you can see a couple of these are plate-like looking grains. And so you can imagine if you're looking at one, uh, one face of the grain, it's gonna look one way. If you rotate it, it's gonna look another way. So your analysis section uh, will influence what a grain will look like, uh, and that can be important if you have any kind of a preferred grain shape distribution. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of stereolog stere stereolog stere stereology research that can go into understanding this. Um, this is just an example I had uh, from a, a solar cell film uh, that we were we were preparing with a focused ion beam with something called low incident surface milling, where you're you're using an, uh, a fib beam to cut a smooth surface into the material, but you're coming in at a slight glancing angle. So in this case, it's about one and a half degrees glancing angle. So even with that small uh, angle, as you cut into the material, you're going deeper into the film. And when your film's only a few microns, uh, you you are penetrating into the depth of that. And what we saw with the results. Um, is that the, the grain size um, was getting smaller deeper into the material. And what that was able to do is to say something about the, the grain growth mechanism in this case, but it was an example that, you know, depending on what depth we were at, we would get different measurements uh, in the material. And, of course, for a film or for uh, something, it, it would be important to know that. And so to show you what I mean by type 1, this is just a slide from uh, one of Carl Thompson's papers showing this type one or type two grain growth. And you can see the type one, it kind of looks like an ice cream cone. So the deeper you are, the smaller the grains are gonna look, uh, which is what we were seeing with that thin film material. And so again, it's just important to recognize that EBSD is looking at 2D uh, representations of a 3D microstructure. So we are looking at a, at a projection. And so with that, I just wanna summarize is that you know, EBSD can measure grain size from a wide range of materials and grain sizes. Um, we measure these directly from measured crystallographic orientations, and we don't need imaging grain boundary contrast to do that. Uh, the special boundaries can be identified and excluded uh, during the grain grouping process, and that the non-index points can be grouped together and, and identified and measured as these anti-grains for things like pores. And with that, I will conclude. Okay, well, we do have quite a lot of questions that have come in, so um, Matt will take a look at those in a second. But in the interim, I'd just like to apologize um, for the clicking noise that some of you have been hearing on the audio. Um, we did work with ON24 to try and remove this, um, but unfortunately, they were unsuccessful. Um, it may be that it's uh, actually on Matt's line. Um, I hope that it didn't interfere too much with your enjoyment of the presentation. Um, and we'll do our best to try and uh, edit it out um, for the on-demand version um, of the webinar, which will be late, uh, available later today. Okay, Matt, over to you for the questions. Okay, so I'm looking through here a few of the questions. Um, first one, is the anti-grain definition available in the older versions of software? Uh, unfortunately, no, it is a new uh, feature that's gonna be introduced in our OIM Analysis 8 that'll be um, introduced this summer, uh, and so the uh, easy answer may not be the greatest answer, but it is what we're doing. Um, the next one here, is it possible to measure grain sizes under one micron? Uh, yes, it is. We can go down to grains, uh, again, to that 20 to 50 nanometer range with averages of 50 nanometers or higher. I can generally do that. Um, there is one here, it says um, there are two different distributions, the number average and the area average, uh, and it says what's the difference and how are they weighted. Uh, if we go back to the slide, 
Luckily, Sue showed me how to do this. You can see the number average is just a, a conventional numerical average. You take everything and divide it by the total number. If we look at the area average, the area is used in the weighting. And so, um, again, the, the trick with this will, will often depend on how many grains you're looking at and, and of course, the, the, the width of the distribution for how that's affected. Um, as far as there was another question here for would you use area fraction or number fraction to calculate using like a Hall-Petch equation? Uh, I would generally use a number fraction, um, but I, I can't really say if I know that's correct, but that would be my inclination because that's going to give the, the, the truest representation, I think, of grain boundary density. You know, the small grains will, will contribute uh, to that effect as much as the, as the large grains, so I would try to weight them equally. Um, but that's, that's my impression without really knowing if that's correct. Okay, there's a couple more here. Uh, there's one here that says, why do you expect a normal grain distribution? Or how would you know if there's a cluster of small grains or a couple of large grains? Uh, I usually don't actually always expect a normal grain distribution. Um, you know, it will certainly vary, and I didn't put some examples of other ones in. Uh, certainly, if you start to get to bimodal or trimodal uh, grain distributions, it's a little bit trickier characterization problem because you you generally either have to say, I'm going to focus on the small grains, I'm going to focus on the large grains, or I'm going to spend a lot more time uh, collecting data to try to cover all those at the same time. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we've, we've looked at both. Um, but it's, you know, you, the, the easiest answer without having to worry about the time it takes is to say cover a, a large area to get both large and small grains and cover it with a fine step size. Um, and then let's see here. Another question is, what is the step size recommended for, this says a 5 by 50 micron area with 1 micron grains. Um, I, I would probably, again, I, if, if you're talking 1 micron diameter grains, I would divide that at least by a factor of 5. So start at 200 nanometers, 100 to 200 nanometers is probably what I would start with and uh, see if that seems to give a pretty good view of the microstructure. You know, the trick is every time you cut the step size by a factor of 2, you increase your acquisition time by a factor of four. So a lot of it just depends on, you know, microscope availability and cost versus the measurement you're after. And so what I don't want to push is the idea to say, you know, spend as much, you know, do a perfect measurement because as we could see from, say, this chart here, you know, we, we can get a decent idea of the microstructure you know, really we could probably even go up to this 1.2 micron step sizes, and it's about 60 times faster than we got with the 150 nanometer step size. And this is, of course, for a specific distribution. But just being aware of the trade-offs between the step size and the time uh, can help make your collection a little bit more efficient. So I haven't been... Here's another a really good question here with how do you know if you've cleaned up your map too much or less than enough? And that's that's a you know that's a question that's worthy really of its own webinar. Um, I'll, I'll try to give you my thoughts on it. Whenever I look at a data set, the first thing I try to do is look and say what's what what's my fraction of high confidence points? You know, and ideally when I do that, and I, I usually do a, a grain CI standardization and then a filter of 0.1 or 0.2 uh, confidence index in the software, and then I see what percentage of that is. And a lot of times, uh, you know, at least in an ideal world, that number is high, 96, 97, 99. Um, if it's less than that, I want to know why. Uh, and so when I say that, I might look and say, show me some of the patterns that have a low confidence index to say, is it, you know, am I misindexing points? Am I not getting strong enough patterns? Is there a phase I'm not expecting? Just so I can say for the points I'm not indexing, is there something I can do about it or is this inherent to the, the structure? You know, it's very fine grained, it's heavily deformed. Do I need to adjust my camera? I want to make sure to say whatever points I can index, I, I have a general idea why not. 
once I have that, then I'm going to try to decide my cleanup. And if I'm measuring grain size, I generally try to minimize the amount of cleanup I do because I don't want to grow them beyond what I've measured. Now, the difficult with that is if you're trying to do grain boundary misorientations, you need to make sure the grains are touching each other. And so a lot of times we have a, what, a feature called grain dilation, which allows the grains to grow out a step. Uh, and so often what I'll do is I will report grain size with one level of cleanup or, or just that standardization, and then I will dilate it and compare the two grain boundary distributions to see the effects of that. To, to get a feel for if I'm, you know, I don't want to create an artificial microstructure, but I don't want to create misrepresentation by not having two grains touching each other for misorientations. I think we have time for at least one more question, which is, uh, please give some comments concerning investigation of polyphase material uh, containing grains with different hardnesses. Uh, and so, you know, really the issue with that is, of course, getting uh, patterns from materials of different hardnesses in preparation, uh, which can be very tricky uh, just because as the hardness uh, changes, you can get differential polishing rates and smearing and all sorts of things that don't help pattern formation. Um, the, 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 there, there's a number of different sample preparation ways of trying to approach that, um, including things like specific cloths and, and you know, more aggressive abrasives for less times and things like ion beams. Um, the other thing as far as as for uh, measuring grains, um, you have to be a little bit careful. You know, with, with grain size, we're very aware of, of our sample tilt angle. You know, we're, when we expect to be tilted to 70 degrees, if these grains are polished at different rates, it's not really at 70 degrees, so the beam isn't necessarily going exactly where we think it's going. So your grain size um, measurements can be a little bit skewed by that. Um, but generally the biggest issue from, from a material like that is more sample preparation. Uh, and again, I think we even have a, we may have a saved webinar on that. And if not, it's one we probably should do. So with that, I think we're, we're about at our hour. So I'll probably stop there. And any questions that weren't answered, um, We'll go ahead and answer by email. Um, and so thank you very much for your attention.